you really get out of something what you put into it and don't lose don't lose sight of that you know keep your eye on the prize have some goals um, and always have sort of a, um, you know kind of a reachable and an unreachable you know I tell kids the same thing when they're doing their college search I was like well you know pick one that you think is a surefire and then aim higher and aim, aiming higher is is how we achieve greatness hi I'm Nora Jones. Welcome to It's About Language. This podcast connects language and culture to life, learning, and hope. You'll experience insightful conversations with creative leaders in the fields of education, business, arts, and science. My guests shed light on the impact of language and culture on individuals and society as they share their stories and experiences. You'll be informed and inspired as we explore how language and culture make us human and bring hope in the midst of a challenging world. Well, today it is my great pleasure to welcome my friend, my colleague uh, for a long time, Ken Stewart. And Ken, welcome. Thank you. Uh, I'm just so glad that you're here. You know, Ken, you and I have had an opportunity to serve on varieties of boards, but it's just fascinating to me how many leadership positions you've had, how many boards you've served on, but especially the application of of excellence and greatness in, in teaching and in reaching out to others like you're the first National Foreign Language of the Teacher of the Year from the American Council on Teaching of Foreign Languages and you won the award, the Florence Steiner Award for Leadership in Foreign Language Education, K-12. And you go all over the world providing presentations and trainings for folks, especially for the college board, for advanced placement courses and so forth. It's been quite a ride, hasn't it, Ken? It really has. I, I feel like um, I, I never really want to say my career has crested, but it has been a, a very interesting trajectory, Nora, in terms of where I've gone from the classroom to out into educational communities and connecting with teachers, like you say, around the world. And now we're doing that in a more virtual world, but I find it just as meaningful to be able to uh, help teachers uh, wherever they are in their chronology of uh, career and life. And tell me, why did that trajectory surprise you? What were some of the elements of surprise? And I'm Please fold in what's going on right now with this remote experience that's going on. Yeah, I think we've seen uh, a, a real shift in education and it's caused us to stop, pause and reflect on what is it that we do best in the classroom and how can we transfer that to a remote setting? And I think for many of us, it's been quite a shock. Um, uh, I know for me, it was a bit of a jolt when I walked out of my uh, classroom at Duke University back on March 3rd, we left for spring break and I didn't know that I would not be seeing those students again. And so it was a quick shift for how can I maintain this momentum? How can I um, grow, continue to grow and foster that sense of community um, on a computer screen? And it wasn't easy. I think we're still seeing that we're still learning uh, we certainly all experienced the frustration um, and just trying to establish new norms in, in teaching and learning. It's interesting because you bring up the word community again. And what are some of the elements of community that were found in a face-to-face experience? And how are those being challenged now in this remote environment in which we're working? Yeah, I always think that that was perhaps a strength of mine, and I don't really have a secret as to how I did it. I think you uh, grow into it, you learn by observing, and it comes with experience, certainly. But um, I would attribute any of my successes to having a strong sense of community in the classroom. And um, people have been asking for tips. Well, how do I do that the first day of class? online. And, uh, you know, I've only been mildly successful, I would say, in in achieving that. But to me, that is one of the foundations for uh, trust among students. We all know the research tells us um, how important that is for students to be comfortable, to be in an environment where they, especially learning languages, where they feel free to take risk. 
and just a buy-in. You know, I feel like so many times I was able to maximize or approach a maximizing a student's potential because he or she knew that they had more at stake with me than just a grade. And you know how that is, Nora. Mm-hmm. You're not going to let your friends down. So if you have that sense of companionship and that camaraderie, I would say more like in a professional setting, um, you're not going to let down that friend, colleague, teacher, uh, person that you admire and that you know that uh, you have buy-in already. And I would say one example that comes to mind is, you know, I often taught uh a whole string of siblings. And so the precedent was already set there that, you know, this is the way he runs things and you won't want to do this and this, and this is what pleases him. And that was already, that was already done for me. Uh I think of many families where I taught all four siblings or more sometimes. And then of course it comes full circle when you begin to teach the children of your former students. <laughs> yes. Ooh, that's that that right. first time that happens. Ouch. Right, right. I remember a young woman walking in with a photo from the early 90s. She says, do you know this girl? I was like, well, sure. That's us in Costa Rica, circa 1991. She said, well, that's my mom. Yeah. Well, of course, you know, you want to fall out on the floor at that point. But, um, <laughs> you know, I had I said, yes, well, not only do I know your mom, I know your grandparents. And I remember them coming to open house. And, you know, that sense of buy in, like I said, you know, it seems cl- kind of cliche, but I, I tell you, it holds true when when we say that uh, kids don't uh, care how much, you know, until they know how much you care. And I really believe that. I mean, that was sort of my mantra all along is Spanish was my vehicle, you know, to getting them to do many, many things. And um, I just feel like that that was something that I attribute my success to is a, a reputation. And again, you can't create that overnight, but you start, you know, I think of it as almost this metaphor of building a cathedral, you know, an architect mm-hmm. rarely sees the finished work. You know, you look at Antonio Gaudi, for example, and that great masterpiece. I think that's what teachers are. They really are architects. We build that scaffolding. We start with that firm foundation or what we hope is a firm foundation. And then we start to craft and we're influenced by trends or architectural styles or trends in education that come along. And boy, we know there have been many. Mm -hmm. And so I just think of that as really molding and shaping a student, much like building that great work of art that you may never see the fruit of your work. Uh, You may never enjoy that long lasting monument, but we really are kind of bridge bridge builders in that regard in terms of connecting students to the world around them. And the, the discipline is really just a means to do that. Don't you think? I do think so, Ken. And that's really interesting. And I'm looking again at that image of building that cathedral and so forth. When you have been working with other educators, when you've been out in the world, even with non-educators, potentially, there were various, I'm assuming, ways that you would provide a snapshot of showing that the building was under construction, if you mm-hmm. will. Mm-hmm. And first of all, to address that, is is that true? How do you help people that don't necessarily see the signposts or recognize the structure to realize that they are progressing, that it will take time but they will be able to set a foundation. And then, again, in today's world right now, where people are remote, how do they read that more from afar? Right. Well, I think like learning, leadership, um, building that community, it's sort of stepping stone kind of learning. And uh, I celebrate the, the small things, you know. Like I said, you can't always just... Um, You can't emerge as a leader tomorrow. You can't emerge as a great teacher. Uh, You can't really become a hero overnight. Mm -hmm. And so I think, you know, it is a a greater challenge uh, teaching remotely, but there are still things you can do. Those sidebar conversations, I think, become more important. Uh, The type of feedback, because we don't have the Um, body language, really. We don't have that um, nonverbal feedback, just the, you know, it could be an approving uh, nod of the head or it can be a glare of the eye, you know, that communicates (laughs) a lot in a classroom. And we don't really have that. You know, I've seen some (laughs) teachers, they're like, boy, I'm glad to have that mute button on that kid. Finally, (laughs) I've been looking for that, you know, but, (laughs) but by, by the same token, 
you know, I find that it's more important now, those one-on-one -on -one conferences. I think about the written feedback and how that's going to be interpreted. I mean, words are powerful. And especially as a language lover myself, I think about what am I really saying to a student? Is this going to help them grow? Uh, how is this going to be? What is the tone of what I'm saying? So I really think we have to think about all of the different types of input and vibe that we're, we're giving off. And you know, that's true, whether it's in a classroom, in the workplace, even within your family unit, you know, we tend to build trust among those relatives or our coworkers. Uh, when we meet people on the job, I think about when I meet people in traveling, uh, you know, sometimes you sense it. It is sort of a non-tangible to me in terms of, you know, what did I do to uh, build that sense of community. I think about the physical environment too, that I don't have any more with the remote learning. Mm. I mean, my classroom was a sanctuary and I hate to keep coming back to the cathedral or the temple or the synagogue image there, but it really was a part of belonging. And I think that is really the key to any sort of community. Everyone wants to feel like they belong. They want to feel like they're a part of a, a whole. And, you know, I think about what's been going on around the world. And we see, for example, I remember back in the spring, just the, the tragedies that kept we seeing in the news with Italy and Spain, and then it, before it pivoted to our own country. But I think I, I learned a lot from that. And I see that, you know, in Spain and, and Southern Europe, where the sense of community is so important and that socialization aspect is so key, that they went on a strict lockdown, you know, to preserve the good of the whole. And I see the uh, antithesis of that really in the U.S. now, where we it's more about the individual, you know, mm -hmm. my rights, my refusal to wear a mask sort of things. And, and it's not working, you know, that we're kind of spiraling out of control because of we're holding on to that individuality or individualism, I guess you could say, because it really is a, a mm -hmm. belief system, you know, that uh, that Spain and Italy was willing to sacrifice what they really cherish is that, you know, going to a tapas bar, having that uh, glass of wine with a friend, uh, they were willing to go on lockdown and do it from their balconies or within their homes to be able to do that as a community again. Does that make sense that it does? You know, have you observed that kind of thing and that, you know, the American spirit is about individuality and freedoms and have it your way. But um, maybe that's not what's best for the community, quote unquote, the community at large. Well, it's really interesting that you bring that up, Ken, because you're comparing things that, yeah, we can read about it in various items, but you're especially sensitive to it because you've experienced those cultures and have thought about them and brought them to others. And I was about to ask about that. You know, when, when you teach language and you teach culture, you're teaching about ways of looking at the world. And mm -hmm. so there's a community, a development of a cross-cultural, a cross-linguistic community in the nature of teaching. What kind of impact do you think that does world language education have on building that community, fostering that sense of confidence that you've spoken about already, that that foundation, what kind of role does it play? Well, I think as language educators, um, we're primed to tackle those sorts of challenges um, in that our discipline, our content uh, lends itself to that. That And by the, that, I mean breaking down barriers, looking at uh, things from different perspectives. And how many times has a kid approached you uh, and you say, well, and he says, well, that's weird. Why do they do it that way? Mm -hmm. Well, and, and it really is helping them understand that it's uh, a matter of cultural perspective, right? That, yeah. um, you know, otherwise, if we don't drill down uh, to those deeper levels of understanding, it does remain a very weird thing that they do in a faraway place. And I think that to me is sort of the key to unlocking whether it be a classroom culture, whether it be a quote unquote foreign culture, is helping helping them understand the underpinnings of those um, cultural perspectives, if you will. And I know we talk about those a lot, but you know, I like to share the words products, practices, and perspectives with students. That should not be reserved just for teacher talk or teacher lingo. Mm -hmm. That um, if we really want the kids to understand 
cultural different levels, then I think we start with that, lead with that, uh, with those conversations with them. You know, Ken, I have a question that maybe it feels a little controversial. Here we go. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, There's a, there can be a touchiness of identity that comes, the, the kind of feeling that you alluded to a little bit, or so I perceive with the, you know, don't tell me what to do. Uh, Mm -hmm. type of thing. And uh, I believe that I've experienced sometimes that, say, community members or or parents, guardians are a little concerned about their their family members, their children, for example, learning another language and learning about other cultures because it feels like it might be, uh, might lead them to not be themselves, not be their own culture, to think disrespectfully potentially of their own culture, to frankly kind of turn into a different person. And that scares people every once in a while. That's been something that I believe I have seen. What do you perceive that? Absolutely. I mean, I come from a, you know, very small town here in North Carolina. And I've remained in Chapel Hill for all of my professional and academic career, for sure. But think about what you just said there in terms of uh, it's keeping me from being the true me. Well, language and culture have developed the me that I know today. And so by saying you're I think you're really shutting the world off by saying I want to grow up in my bubble or I want to instill these values. That's how we evolve as human beings, I think, is by shaping uh, ourselves and the world around us. I can't imagine right now, I can't imagine my life uh, not being bilingual. To me, that is who I am. Mm -hmm. And so I've taken on my passion for language. um, and, And I've just been very fortunate in that my passion has become my career. They're one in the same. And I see that in terms of my identity, which you bring up that that is a part of my identity. Some people say, well, Ken, I think you were born in the wrong place. Well, maybe so. Um, You know, or, you know, people ask me, well, Ken, how did you get into languages or Spanish? It's not a very interesting story, I don't think, other than it was just a curiosity. I mean, I've, as long as I can remember, I've had this affinity for, wow, I wonder, you know, why do they say it that way? Why do they do it that way? Why do they believe that way? Why do they behave that way? And from, you know, the time I could read, you know, it automatically flipped to the foreign phrases in the back of a a dictionary before looking up words. And I've just had this curiosity that um, has allowed me to evolve, I think, as a human being. And I think, you know, in seeing my own friends and family come to understand that with me over the years has been very revealing and and very rewarding, I have to say. Um, You know, I consider my my parents to be quite provincial in terms of just their way of thinking. And they thought it was the strangest thing that I would want to pursue Spanish as a career. And, you know, by certain uh, token, I guess you could say 20, 30 years ago, they were kind of right. It was, you know, that is a a break from the norm or what are you going to do with that? And I didn't know at the time, but, um, you know, I was told many times I would never find a job or I was wasting my time. And now I look at where we are in 2020 and, mm-hmm. you know, we, we've got, we've got our pick of jobs because we're bilingual. And uh, I see people losing their jobs because they're not bilingual and bicultural. I mean, there are a lot of people out there running around who dabble and speak other languages. But as I tell my own students and even my college students today, there are far fewer that understand those cultural nuances. And I teach a writing course. And I said, and that's where the nuances come through. Um, Again, there are a lot of speakers. There are not as many writers, thinkers. Mm -hmm. And yeah, to me, that's the difference. You know, Ken, you mentioned a a bit back there in your description about that folks had said, or maybe, and you maybe even agreed with them for a moment there that you Mm -hmm. might've been born in the wrong place or so forth. (laughs) Yet the story that you just told proves that you were born in exactly the right place. Isn't it intriguing that because you have that interest, again, folks move you sort of in that path of, well, then that's where you should have been instead of 
what we understand as world language educators and users, that that bridging in your very person of the the linguistic and cultural setting in which you were born and this new setting and language has provided an enriched experience. I think that's fascinating that 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 is that is celebrated in so many places and not necessarily in the United States as much that what you've brought. Yes, I I would agree with you 100 percent. Like I said, that, um, you know, I am who I am today because of all of those experiences I've had, whether they were in school or in social interactions, academic settings, uh, travel, um, maybe even some, you know, obstacles that we've all have to overcome. But I think that all all those things mm-hmm. shape who we really are. And, um, you know, I'm not saying that I'm, I'm, I should try to be someone that I'm not. Absolutely. I mean, I'm very um, proud of the upbringing that um, my family was able to provide. I come from a very loving family in that regard. But again, um, I feel like the ability to speak and connect with people in other cultures is really what has shaped my very being. And and I, I really am, I continue to celebrate that every day when I can uh, enjoy literature in another language, music in another language. Um, I can you know, order my own food if I go to a different country. And I really, Nora, I like to be a chameleon, you know, especially in the <laughs> Spanish speaking world, uh-huh. um, you know, because how many times has a parent asked me, well, what kind of Spanish do you teach? The Castilian Spanish or Mexican Spanish? And my response has just always been, I teach Spanish, uh-huh. right? And that it really is about uh, exposing uh, students and that learner to all types of forms of Spanish, right? Including Spanish here in the U.S. And so to me, that's really been an important piece to say that, you know, if I go to Argentina, sure, I try to blend in. And if I go to Spain, yep, that pronunciation comes out within a couple of hours, probably, because I really enjoy being a part and blending into that community. You know, Ken, you mentioned a couple of things I'm going to tie together for just a moment. You mentioned about that you had the opportunity to have a career in employment because you're bilingual and that there are folks that have not been able to retain jobs because they're not bilingual. And you've also, I'm tying in here, the work that you've done with teachers around this country and around the world and help to pull some of that together about where the opportunities lie and when you're talking to others, their vision, do they see that? Is that something that they bring or that you encourage them along with how to teach about bringing the community and that vision? Yes, I think all, all effective and should we say great teachers are visionaries. They have a path in mind of where they want to take that uh, student or that particular class. And and just with my interaction with teachers in other schools, and I've been in a variety of settings, uh, public, private, um, um, even um, international American schools abroad, you know, kids are still kids no matter where you go. And that's been a very beautiful thing to um, uncover is that their needs are the same, uh, their desires, you know, to be kids and to want to be uh, heard and respected um, and loved is, is something that, that I see no matter where I go. But yeah, I would certainly try to tell the teacher to start with uh, share it, being a bit vulnerable yourself. And even to this day, one of the first things I do on the first day of class is I put myself out there. Uh, and let the students uh, get to know me. I, I don't start by saying, well, tell me about yourself uh, because I've been to school many times by this point in my life. Mm-hmm. And so I like to start with that um, segue into, I mean, yeah, they need to hear the language from the first day and, and they do. But um, I, I know with you know teaching high school for so many years, uh, you really have to like I say, sometimes connect with that kid outside of class or as classes are changing. And the same is true, I think, for teachers. You know, they like to be reassured about 
what they're doing. So many times teachers, you know, ask me a question. Uh, they say, well, do you think I should uh, do this or that? And I'm like, well, that's totally your decision. But let's think about why you're making that decision. There's not a right or wrong to that, but understand why you're making the decision that you're making in terms of whether it be curriculum or um, just intuition. A lot of times is really what's what's uh, guiding us. You know, the intuition and based on also you opening with vulnerability and so forth, there's some awarenesses that strikes me there. And that segues into the question that you provided me ahead of time. How do we measure greatness in teaching? Is it related to those kinds of elements as well? Absolutely. Um, you, you can't be a great teacher without knowing your content. I mean, I think we can accept that, that that is one of the first steps, right? Because knowing your content allows you then to delve into these other factors that we've talked about here today. And, you know, I think about uh, measuring greatness, something that is so um, elusive, we think maybe, and it's not going to be captured in any teacher evaluation instrument. Uh, I can think of all the times that I was observed, for example, I think maybe twice the observer actually spoke the language that I was teaching and I gave much more um, respect, much more credence to their feedback than any of the others that didn't really understand what was going on in front of the room. And so, yes, I think greatness is something that you you know it when you experience it, right? It's not something that you set out to do. It's something that you you grow into. Uh, or like I said, you, you, you know when a lesson goes well, that was a great lesson. You know when the day goes well. You have this great feeling about yourself. And, you know, you can look back and say, boy, that was a great year. We really came a long ways. Uh, or that was a great uh, uh, stride that I was in at that particular school or that setting. So to me, it has to be something that uh, you feel almost innately. Uh, it's not something that you set out to do. And I wouldn't even use that to describe myself. I mean, yes, I've, I've been very lucky in many respects in that I've won lots of awards, but is it because of greatness? I'm not so sure. But I think we can see commonalities of great things happening. If we look at all the great educators, the great leaders, um, you know, many of them have several elements in common, things like charisma, vision, passion that we've talked about earlier. And, you know, you think about what makes a great coach. You know, I, I grew up in Chapel Hill, so I'm from the era of, you know, Dean Smith and Roy Williams. Mm -hmm. We can all agree that, you know, greatness came with with respect, with with rigor and trust and many, many other adjectives to describe greatness. And I would I would equate that to, um, you know, being a great teacher in the classroom. You, you know it when you feel it, even if you don't speak the language. Let me go back to that point. I can walk into, let's say, a Chinese class. And even though I don't speak the language, I can detect greatness or let's just tone it down. I can detect effectiveness. I can um, I can uh, document or I can cite examples of where that's, that teacher uh, had a rapport because a lot of times it is the non-linguistic cues that tell us uh, that that teacher is being effective. And I think we all know it uh, when we feel it ourselves. And oftentimes I think that is communicated uh, by what we do as well, communicated to others. And to me, that's a really powerful thing. That's very powerful. There's so many more elements that are about personality and knowing oneself. Right. Absolutely. Totally amazing. Now, Ken, you are the you established a scholarship through the Southern Conference on Language Teaching, on board of that is history, and the SCOLT, uh, the acronym there. You mm -hmm. developed a scholarship through SCOLT. Tell us about that scholarship. What is that intended to do, my friend? Yes, and thank you for bringing it up, Nora. That's something very uh, near and dear to my heart. I think about, you know, how am I going to leave a legacy? Um, I, you know, have not written many great, great books. I've not really, um, you know, I have, I guess, helped a lot of young teachers along the way, student teachers and those sorts of things. 
But I really feel like we're at a crossroads in the profession where we need to build that pipeline with the next up and coming language teachers. So the scholarship is established for high school seniors who uh, demonstrate promise um, in the language and particularly for becoming uh, a language teacher at any level. So I guess we're going into our third year now um, and it's just been very exciting to discover these uh, up and coming uh, shining stars, if you will, uh, out there in language classes and provide them with some sort of monetary reward to allow them to hopefully travel abroad or to help offset some of the cost of, of college. And so to me, um, I'm just thrilled to be a part of that. I'm, I get to read their portfolio. We invite them to the conference and celebrate who they are. And we're trying to maintain um, contact with them so that they're reporting back to us, uh, letting us know how things are going because we don't want this to just be a one-off uh, here's your check kind of thing. So we really want to, as we said earlier, we want to grow a community. Uh, I want to build a community of uh, promising young teachers that can uh, take my place in the classroom. That's great, Ken. And I know there are so many people that are so grateful for it, uh, not only the recipients, but also those of us that are looking at the power and the encouragement that that brings. So thank you for that. Absolutely. Thank you. When you look out now that we have listeners that have been listening to this conversation, what would you invite them to do? What would you encourage them to do to to take action, to enter into this conversation, to find their own voice, and to found, find their power, greatness, and community? Well, that's kind of a, a loaded question. Yes, it is. <laughs> uh, it's a multiple-part question. Um, I think one has to really reflect on what, what do you want out of this, uh, job, this, uh, career, the, what do you want for yourself? And, um, I think to participate in this conversation, um, you know, find, find your curiosity, you know, what is your niche? I feel like I found mine early on. I was lucky in that, you know, by the time I was, 21 years old, I really felt like I had found my career and I was in it for the long haul. I mean, people ask me, where do you see yourself in 10 years? I was like, right here, no doubt. Where do you see yourself in another 10 years? I'm like, oh, I'll still be here. <laughs> and I was. Um, but, you know, I tell kids today, I said, you know what? Discover your passion, discover a new passion because no one stays in a job for 30 years anymore. There's always new opportunities coming along. And I would say, make those opportunities happen. You know, for me, it's been a strong work ethic, more than intelligence. Certainly that's not been my <laughs> gift, I would say. But I am, I am where I am, but surely because of my work ethic. And, you know, uh, I guess you could say, well, I'm a workaholic. Those of, those of you who know me personally would probably use that word a long time ago to describe me. And I don't deny it, but at the same time, I feel like I've reaped the benefits of those hours and, um, you know, the, the effort that I have put into to this. And to me, that's that's what I would leave our listeners with is you really get out of something what you put into it and don't lose don't lose sight of that. You know, keep your eye on the prize, have some goals um, and always have sort of, a, um, you know, kind of a reachable and an unreachable. You know, I tell kids the same thing when they're doing their college search. I was like, well, you know, pick one that you think is a surefire and then aim higher. And aim, aiming higher is is how we achieve greatness. That's really cool. And uh, I, I would say that the, the workaholic has definitely been part, but always the very kind and compassionate workaholic, my friend. <laughs> well, thank always. you. <laughs> always. Thank you so much. Yeah. Well, Ken, thank you. Thank you for sharing your experiences and thoughts with our listeners today and for your ideas about just how to find that community. It's very touching, that foundation. That I really do still have that image of a cathedral, my friend. Well, thank you. It's been a pleasure to speak with you. And Ken, you take good care and uh, keep bringing that excellence. And thanks for everything you're doing. Likewise, Nora. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. If you enjoyed it, please share it with your friends, family, and colleagues. Let's continue the conversation. Be sure to check out my website, 
fluencyonline.com to learn more about our guests and to check out the resources and information they've shared with us there. I have other ideas, resources, and opportunities there for you too. Again, thanks so much for listening. And until next time.